We're thankful that God has sent Larry Brown to be with us tonight. Amen? Let's welcome him. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I hadn't had this much fun since I preached with Benny Hinn. I'm just kidding. I want you to take your Bible, if you will, please, and turn it with me to the book of Isaiah. You can turn anywhere you want to. It don't matter. It's all good. But I'm going to be hanging around the 45th chapter. Isaiah chapter number 45. I want you to take your Bible for the sake of time and just hold it there. And I want you to see a, a particular thought out of this chapter. And I'll preach and give you the, the verses for the points and read the verses as I go to save a little bit of time. I want you to look, though, if you will, please, with me and note that on six different occasions in this chapter, in verses number 5, verses number 6, verses number 14, 18, 21, and 22, God digs a thought very deep in the hearts and minds of the reader. Verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. Look at verse number 6, the latter part. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Notice with me verse number 14, the latter part. Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God or no God like this God to compare to this God. Verse number 18, the latter part. I am the Lord, and there is none else. You look at verse number 22, the latter part, it says, For I am God, and there is none else. I want to preach tonight for just a little while on the subject. Ain't nobody like it. Ain't nobody like it. I mean, if you go to the Word of God and find the woman with the issue of blood who was fixed to his hymn, and when she came up healed, you could ask her, what do you think? She said, ain't nobody like him. You catch that adulterous woman who has been cleansed and sanctified and purified by the loveliness of the Word of God. You catch her and you ask her, what was it like when you was fallen and thrust at the feet of Jesus? When you got up and looked at him, what did you think? She said, I thought ain't nobody like him. You catch, saw, uh, you catch Silas as he was tagging along with the greatest evangelist in the Bible. You'll see him fastened in the prison walls. It was about midnight. Paul looked over and said, Silas, what do you think about him? Silas said, I don't know, Paul. Can you tell me something good? Paul said, ain't nobody like it. And all of a sudden, all of nature's fury and all of nature's power began to quiver under the feet of God's people. You go over there to Simon Peter, who had failure on the Sea of Galilee one night, but come walking on the sea to him was the Lord Jesus, and he spoke three words, Lord, save me. God was in saving distance, and God reached down and picked him up. And he carried him back. You say, I think he walked back. I don't think he could walk nowhere. He towed him back. And when he put him in the ship, John said, what do you think, Peter? Simon said, ain't nobody like it. <laughs> ain't nobody like it. <laughs> you go over there and you get that Gadarean that's been freed to go home and see his children. That Gadarean that was loaded with demons enough to run 2,000 hogs crazy. You get that gathering down there that's been freed and been delivered. When you see him two weeks after with his wife walking on the boardwalk, uh, just rejoicing with his wife in a calm and a serene manner. Uh, somebody walked up and said, hadn't seen you in a while. I uh, said, I heard the Nazarene touch you. What do you think? He said, ain't nobody like it. <laughs> you go to Mary and Martha. When he floored death, at the tomb of their brother. 
later when, when Lazarus was sitting there talking to Jesus and Mary is at his feet. Martha's in the kitchen cooking hamburgers and french fries. They, the, Mary and Lazarus was talking in there. Mary said, tell me, Lazarus, what do you really think about him? Lazarus was wiping tears and said, ain't nobody like him. I came to tell you tonight, there ain't nobody like him. The disciples were fishing at night and all of a sudden the fog is thick, so thick you can cut it and take a slice of it home with you. I mean, it's bad out there, the wind's blowing and here comes Jesus walking on the water and all of a sudden the, the, the wind cease, the storm calms and John turns around and looks at Simon Peter and said, Simon, who do you think it is? He said, it ain't no question because ain't nobody like him. I don't know but one that can do this. Thank God, when old Stephen was being flogged to death and when he opens his eyes and the rocks are pounding him and death is biting at his heels and he's almost gone, he stands and his eyes gaze up into heaven and he looks up at one who has now come off the throne and is standing at the right hand of God. He said, ain't nobody like it. John is forsaken on the Isle of Patmos. He's in loneliness. But afterwards, when God chose him for a particular purpose, to see the revelation and the revolution of God, he took him up and let him see the entirety of the last days. If you could yank John out of heaven tonight and say, what do you think about him? He'd say, I got to tell you, ain't nobody like him. You can go through the fires and you can go through the quagmire of life, but I want to tell you tonight, if you go through with Jesus, you're going through with somebody that ain't nobody like it. What about it, Isaiah? What do you think? What do you think? Man of faith, man of means, man of literature, and man of penmanship. What do you think? What do you think about him? Well, he goes over into Isaiah chapter 45 and writes and writes on six different verses and says, I am God and beside me there is no other. I know there are a lot of folks today making a lot of claims and I know we got a lot of movements today that's boasting a lot of uh, messianic promises and messianic signs. But I want to tell you there's a God beating in your heart and a God running around in my soul tonight that we can say he does not come with any other for nobody comes close to being like him ain't nobody like him <laughs> look in this chapter of scripture quickly write this outline down about all I can do is give it to you but look at it in his foreknowledge ain't nobody like him in his foreknowledge he scouts the trail ain't nobody I know I'm in a college setting. I'm even in a university setting. But I said, ain't. Ain't nobody like it. Because before you ever got up this morning, the foreknowledge of God went before you and the foreknowledge of God was kicking everything out of the way and fixing a path whereby you today could walk in the power of God. What a mighty God we serve. What a Savior lives in my heart. I mean, he's a God worth singing about. He's a God worth shouting about. He is a God worth praising him for. And I'm sure glad tonight that I can say ain't nobody lucky. When it comes to his foreknowledge in scouting the trail, he goes before so you can come after. I said, he goes before. I'm glad I don't have to lead the way and call him to follow. I'm glad he scouts the trail. I'm glad he's the scout master of fundamentalism. I'm glad he's the one that's out front. He's the one that means something. He's the captain of the Lord's host. Hallelujah. He and he alone ought to be leading the movement that we cherish or we ought to find us a movement where we can find him leading the way. All of us would agree it's a joy to follow him. It's a joy to rejoice in him. And I'm glad tonight, thank God, in his foreknowledge, he scouts the trail. I'm glad when I was lost living in the hell holes of this world, when I was lost, not a, not a guiding light, not a Bible light, but a strobe light run my life. I had no hope and no promise of hope. I had no idea what was going on. 
but God was working on my behalf. I'm glad I can say he was out there where the devil had tried to grip my life. Jesus was out there making a way of salvation, a highway of hope for my life. And he was fixing it so an ignorant man could follow. Uh, so a man who was down and out could get up and in uh, and follow Jesus. A uh, Richard White could come. A uh, Larry Brown could come. Hallelujah. Whosoever will can come if they'll come after the one who's making a way. He scouts the trail. Boy, that day I got saved, I wasn't even looking to get saved. I was under conviction bad, but I didn't know it. You know that feeling where your heart's beating a thousand miles a minute, pumping on the backside of your ribs to where your ribs want to go on vacation? Hello. You say, I don't know what you're talking about. Altars are still in churches for people to find that out. <laughs> I came into a little Southern Baptist church and had a seat on the pew. My little old wife with me, as ignorant and as dumb as a stick, didn't have any scriptural or spiritual knowledge of anything at all to do with heaven or hell. A man six months younger than I was the interim pastor. They had run the preacher off. Thank God they did because he was a cloak-wearing, cigar-smoking liberal. But they called an old boy who didn't have no more sense than just a rare back and preach. I mean, just go after He was sitting in a chair over here the whole time like this. I mean, he was waiting. He thought they'd get out of the way any time. I mean, he was like a South Georgia bird dog pointing at that mic. When that fella finally shut up and sat down, he hit the pulpit. He said, take your Bibles. Lord God, he killed everything in there. I was back in the back. Hiding from it. Scared me to death. I looked about like you do now. He said, verily, verily. I ain't never heard that nowhere while I was hanging out. <laughs> Except a man be born again. He laid about a 50-foot hand across that middle section and was a popping on the end of my Cherokee in your nose. And I mean, let me hold it. Say, so what was it? It was God getting me ready. You do not get saved because you was born in America. You don't have a guarantee that you're going to heaven because you're a Baptist. I want to tell you, if the blood misses you, heaven will miss you. But if the blood hits you, hallelujah, you are secure. Because ain't nobody like it. And I hit that altar. The night, that, that was in the morning service. I got so scared I ran out. Jumped in my car. I had one of them, Brother Bowler, that was jacked up in the back, had a 396 big block, full speed, Muncie, full speed. I mean, it would talk to you <laughs> on the speed bumps at Shoney's. I'm talking bad. <laughs> you rode. I took it. I took Brother White for a ride one night in downtown Atlanta at 2.30 in the morning. We stopped at a Waffle House where all the pillars of society come out at 2 o'clock and have breakfast. <laughs> Woman came over, had a half a tooth in her hand, head and six in her pocket in case something come along good. <laughs> We're in that Chevelle. I bought it back after I got saved. Kept it for a long time. Ba-boom, ba-boom. 
unstoppable. I got in that car and went home. Come back that night and got saved. Got in. I'm talking about got in. Southern Baptist. That boy came back that night and he said, y'all ready? Sure. He wanted some of them over yonder. He come back and he leveled me. I was so bad in the conviction I couldn't have swallowed a French fry on a bet. I hit that altar and God gave me a dose of something I ain't never got over. That was 30 years ago, Brother Hancock. 30 years ago, two Sunday nights ago, God took a drunkard, shook hell out of him, and made him a preacher. One month later, I met an old gravel throat preacher from North Carolina. I'm talking about one of them backwoods boys. I'm talking about them kind, bless God. I mean to tell you, keep them lights right, boys. We want to be right in it. I don't know what a light man is, but let's keep it right in it. I'm going to tell you right now. You know, when you look at them, you need a paramedic watching them. Man, he was preaching in the Holy Ghost power. I mean, he was letting it rip. He was getting it done. He was walking on the back of the benches and wasn't never looking down. I said, dear God in heaven, he come by me and I felt the brush of angels' wings off him. I mean, he was in God, hooked up in the Word, sharing the book, rejoicing over the fact that he couldn't go to hell. He was having himself a time. He stopped right in the middle of that thing. He said, there's somebody here tonight God's dealing with about preaching. He said, if you don't go ahead and surrender, I promise you this, he's going to drag you by, the he by your heels. He'll drag you through whatever he's got to get you through to get you where he wants you. You might as well throw in with him. He gave the invitation. Place was packed out. I stepped out one of the last ones and came down and got pushed up to the front and got wedged under the Lord's supper table. I mean, I was folded up like an accordion. I was under there saying, Lord, I don't know nothing about salvation much. I ain't been saved long enough to know nothing. And, 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 and when he was talking, you was a tapping on me, and I really don't know what to do. About that time, old evangelists come under the table with me. Most of them know who they're talking to. They come under there and grab me by my face. He did. I'm telling you just how it happened. He took me on his face like this, and he pulled me up to his face. He was a sweating like a bull. I mean, he's was, he was, he was soaking wet. He grabbed me. He said, do you know that God's call? Are you who I was talking about? I said, I think I am. He said, what you don't do about it? I said, I don't know. He said, will you do it if he'll let you? I said, I'll do anything if you turn me loose. <laughs> then he turned me loose and grabbed me right here. He said, boy, I'm going to pray a prayer. And I want you to listen to it just like God's listening to it. And I want it to echo through the chambers of your life. I want it to walk up and down in your heart. And I don't want you to ever walk away from it. And that old man laid hands on me and prayed for me and the power of God touched me and the power of God moved on me. And from that night to this, I've been a walking miracle. I want to tell you tonight, don't, don't think, you, you young folk, there's a bunch of teenagers in this meeting. Don't you think for a minute that the NFL's got all of the fun? Don't you think for a minute that the rock concerts is flowing with joy? Don't you think for one minute that serving God has five minutes worth of board a minute? I want to tell you, I have more fun asleep than that whole crowd does. Awake. Help me, boy. He scouts a trail in his foreknowledge. You, you preachers, you're not in this thing directing yourself. You're not in this thing saying, well, what am I going to do today? 
I tell you what, when revival saturates a church, it's not whether or not the pastor knows how to handle it. It's not whether or not the people are deserving of it. It's not whether or not the church is ready for it. I want to tell you, when God gets ready to do something, it's because he's done cleared him off a spot, and he just decides to do it. You know why? That's exactly right. You can't beat him with a stick. He's bad to the ball. Ain't nobody like him. Notice the verse real quickly, real quickly. Where's Ralph? Are you here? Hey, Amen. Let me find my glasses. Look at the verse. I like that boy. I will, look at this. Look at verse 2 of the 40 foot 50. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. I don't need no Hebrew teacher. All due respect, if you speak in Hebrew to your wife, all due respect to you, all that says is anything in your way, I will move it out your way if you'll go my way. Now that's Hebrew. If there's bars, if there's gates, if there's deacons, if there's associations, whatever. I, I'll get I, Come on, boy. Now, why can't you go where God's taking you if he's there before you get there? <laughs> Number two, in his, in his financing, he supplies the treasury. In his foreknowledge, he scouts the trail. I ain't been nowhere today. God wasn't yesterday. Hallelujah. I like that. I ain't been nowhere today that God wasn't already there yesterday. He loves me too much to hurt me. He cares too much to let anybody else bother me. And he's too much God to lie about what he told me he'd do. And in his financing, he supplies the treasury. Notice verse, look at this. I want you to look at this. Look at this. It's in here. This ain't Reader's Digest. It's your Bible. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches and secret places. <laughs> that thou mayest know that I am the Lord which call thee by thy name and the God of Israel. You know what? Let me give you some Hebrew. You want to hear some Hebrew? From the least expected place is where God will reach in and give to you. I'll go where ain't nobody ever been and get what nobody else has ever got. And I'll give it to you that you've never had. <laughs> he, he scouts a trail. It's all right to come down here, isn't it, Brother Byrne? Is it all right? Good. He, he scouts a trail. We ain't got a whole lot of this at home. All we got is just a bunch of this lowly stuff. And I, my nose about to bleed up there. I'm sorry. <laughs> he scouts a trail. That means when you're down there in Gibson, Georgia, down there in Glasgow County, down there where, and don't nobody know where you're at, down there in the country with that crowd that don't know how to respect a preacher or love a preacher, down there where you just got a baptistry and doing all right. God just called this old boy to preach not long ago, and he's been training under us, and he's down there passing the church, down in the woods, down in the wilderness, down yonder in the country. Hey, it's good to know that there's a God who knows where Gibson is and a God who knows how to clear the trail. And a, and a God in his financing who knows how to supply the treasure. What God calls a man to do, God already has the check written. He's just waiting on faith to pick it up. Brother Steve, ain't that good preaching if a white boy is doing it? Amen, Brother Marvin. I've heard some black ones do it pretty good, but a white one's getting to do it tonight. He supplies the treasury. He supplies. We're right in the middle of a building. They're putting pews in our place tonight. 
and I don't even know how I'm going to pay for them in the morning. But I do know this. Me and God's going to be awful embarrassed Friday if he don't do something tomorrow. What did he say? He said, I'll go into the places of secrecy. I'll go into the places where you wouldn't expect me to be able to get it. And I'll bring it to you, not from the hand of the hierarchy, not from the hand of those that you would expect it, but I'll go into the hand where you didn't think it existed. Why? So that you might know the Lord did it, not somebody. I was, I was in a little old town called Minneapolis, North Carolina. Brother, Brother Sexton, I was where... I asked them if there was a McDonald's and they wanted to know what is that. <laughs> I'm talking about up there at Minneapolis, up above Spruce Pine, in between Boone and Todd, up there where there's two lane roads and it's gravel and ain't no line in the middle. If you talk about the line in the middle, they don't know what you talking about. I was up there. I was over. I went to school at Tacoa Falls. That's where Tennessee Temple came and went soul winning every week. Tennessee Temple used to come and hand out tracks. At they never did play much basketball. They just went through the stands. If you just die right now, you know you'd go to heaven. <clears throat> Half the school at Tacoa Falls College got saved under the ministry of Tennessee Temple. I went, I went to school there. <laughs> Ain't we having fun in Tennessee? I was in that little old country church. Uh, they, they called the school and asked, if you got anybody that can preach to a bunch of young people for the weekend? She said, yeah, we got one old boy, and it was during the Vietnam War, and I, most of them was there trying to get out of the battle, you know, and I was there looking for the battle. I just came out of the Navy, and I, I, was, I was ready. Man, I was, so, I was so eager and longing to preach. And I, they said, yeah, we got one boy. Now, we don't know what he'll say. We don't know what he'll do. We'll send him to you, and you take him for what he's worth to you. I got an old 62, 225 electric Buick that I had, I, I'd bought, I mean, both doors looked like the Battle of Armageddon had went off in the back seat. I went off to college and that thing. I drove over there, barely got there, didn't have no money, didn't have nothing. Barely got over there and preached on Friday night, had a time. I mean, God just came in on us. It's in July. In July, just, 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 just had a time. Got off over there, and the preacher left the service, and there was one old man back there trying to turn the lights off, and I was soaking wet. I said, where where'd the preacher go? I said, where do I go? He said, you stay in the prophet's chamber next door. Now, you know those are the spookiest places in America. I need a witness back here. That's black for amen. Would you all come on, please? And so, so, so they took me over there to the, to the prophet's chambers. I went through a little bookstore and went back in the back room where there was a cot with an army blanket on one end, a cot and a sink over here. And I said, I want that cot. That guy said, well, I'll see you tomorrow. I said, yes, sir, I'll see you tomorrow. I ain't had nothing to eat all day long and he gonna see me tomorrow. I sat down, Brother, brother Bird, I sat down on the end of that cot and I, I looked around and I heard a voice say, mm-hmm, flaming evangelist. Cover up in that army blanket, blank, and scratch yourself to death all night long. Go ahead, O thou man of the cloth. Get on that cloth right there. Go ahead, man of God, man of me. Lay down. I laid down on that army cot and pulled up that blanket up over me, and, and, and I, I, I could hear him. He said, you itching yet? I got up the next morning and sat on that cot. Nobody came for breakfast. Nobody came for lunch. I'm sitting at that little old place. I mean, you just don't get in your car and run down at the store and eat. You got to build a store to do that. <laughs> I'm sitting on that army cot. Uh, all of a sudden, about, about 12 o'clock, my stomach starts thinking my throat's cut and goes to growling like a bear. And nobody comes that afternoon. And that night, everybody starts coming for church and I go over there. I'm, I mean, I'm fasting, not by choice. I go in there and preach that night, and, and I'm standing there talking to some young folk, and I look around, and there's that same old toothless deacon standing over there at them lights. Wait, you ready to go yet? I said, uh, where's the preacher? He's gone. He left a few minutes ago. 
I'm going too, son. I'll see you tomorrow. I'm wrapped up in an overcoat, and I'm walking across the bridge to go to the prophet's chambers, and I got a companion. He says, you really got them tonight? Well, they love you so much, they're going to kill you right here in North Carolina. I got, I got over there and sat on that cot and played that little game that night, and they had nothing to eat since Friday morning. Next morning, I got up and put my suit on. I went over there. And the preacher said, you'll be teaching this Sunday school class. I said, I sure will, but I want to talk to you for just a minute. I said, you leave here without me after this class. I'm going to break both of your legs when I find you. <laughs> Comprente, yes, yes. He said, no problem. We're going to eat at so-and-so's house. I said, you can believe that. <laughs> I got up in the service that morning, and God just touched my life, and I preached like a North Carolina Baptist wants you to. Man, we had a meeting. They were flooding all just people enjoying themselves. I was 24, having a time of my life. <laughs> didn't think, didn't think that there was nothing else worth doing but this. I still do. I don't know what the rest of you is doing, but it's a boring. I'd quit and get God to call me to preach if I should. And I, I, got, I preached, and I never will forget this. Old man come walking. Now listen, old man come walking down the, down the aisle. He had on a pair of them overalls, you know, unbuttoned where you can get your hands in them, you know. You know, I'm talking about North Carolina, my music director brother. He's, he's, he's got them overalls on. Old pair of brogans, got the tongue laid out. Looked like a deacon's wife's tongue, you know, laid out. I mean, just laid out, you know. And not here, not here in this church, but other places where I go. laid out he's got on old flannel shirt and old flannel hat and he's got that North Carolina he said bow legged he couldn't hem a hog up in my ditch <laughs> he come up there and held that old felt hat in his hand and shirt didn't look like it had the oil change in it in a month and Wendell, Wendell Critcher, do you know him? He, he was passing the church saying, old man said, can I say something, preacher? Sure. Last name's Carter. He came up and he said, I really did like this boy this weekend. I ain't never done much around here. I don't have nothing. Found out later he lived in a house with a dirt floor. He pulled out, Brother Coleman, he pulled out one of them government envelopes with that manila wind in it, you know. He said, I got my little old government check yesterday or the day before or whatever. He said, God spoke to me back there just to sign it over this kid. He said, uh, young men like this are preaching, old men like this ought to help me. I stuck that in my pocket. We went to some woman's house that cooked on a wood stove. She cooked cornbread that would make your tongue run out your mouth, beat your brains out trying to crawl back in to get it. She had macaroni and cheese on it. I'm talking about bayou cheese. Way down yonder in the swamps of southern Louisiana. Down there where they make something that'll stay with you. She had cheese on it that deep. I eat that little old woman said, Lord have mercy, son. Are you hungry? I said, yes, ma'am, I sure am. The preacher and his food committee had got their wires crossed. One thought the other one was doing it, the other one thought the other one was doing it. Just like a bunch of confused Baptists in a church. They didn't know. And I was sitting in the middle about to die. I had cat head biscuits that big, Brother Ralph. I mean, poke a hole in it, bless God. I, I, dirt or not, pull some sagram syrup in it and had a time. I got in that little Buick and started back to the house. They gave me $50 expenses. I had gas money in my pocket. I opened that little old manila thing and pulled off the side of the road on Sunday afternoon. Pulled off at the gas station to get my gas. And I forgot all about it. And I looked in my pocket and I pulled that little check out. It was $366. That was when you could go to college without, you know, mortgaging your life. I owed the school $360. I had six dollars left. I never will forget it. It was, it was close to Spruce Pine. I opened the car on that Buick. I said, I 
want to talk to you now. You was running your mouth on the cot. Now we're in the car. I want to talk to you now. I couldn't find him when I had something to say. When I had my money, I couldn't find him, Ralph. But glory to God, God was good to me. Hallelujah. You know why God will do that? Cause ain't nobody like it. He, he scouts a trail. He got me and mine. He's clearing a trail. He says it's gonna cost a little something for him to travel this way. And he always has his pockets full. He just says, come on boy. Come on. Because he supplies the treasury. Look at this place paid for. Look at this place where people have labored and people have given and people have sacrificed. Ceiling missing in a few places. We're going to take up an offering and fix that this week. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help I'm going home. We're going to help you. You look so poor and so impoverished. Ceiling, they had to take that down to pay off the last bill so they could say they was out of debt. i tell you what they done. When that revival come through here, they had to knock some of the ceiling out so they wouldn't suffocate. The power of God was in here so good. He's, he's going, he just scouts the trail. In his foreknowledge, he's out there in front of you, preacher. Hey, holler tonight while you can, because you're going to get hollered at when you leave. Go ahead. It's all right. Nobody cares. Just go ahead and say, glory. It's okay. Hey, we ain't going to tell nobody. And, and I, got, I got to tell you this last one. He scouts the trail. He supplies the treasury. And not only that, in his fondness, he specifies the traveler. Right. Amen. He specifies the traveler. Hey, Al, jump up real quick and read, no, read verse 4. Read it like a preacher now. Read it. Read it. Verse number 4. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. Hold it. Read that again. I have even called thee by thy name. One more time. I have even called thee by thy name. Again. I have even called thee by thy name. Read the rest of it. Is that it? I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. When you didn't know him, he was naming you. In his foreknowledge, he scouts a trail. Yes, sir. In his financing, he supplies the treasury. And in his fondness, he signifies the traveler. I know your name. There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home. It's mine, oh yes, it's mine. Oh, with my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven. Woo! Never more help me stick to roam. Amen. Little old, little old boy came to our church one time. I'm done. Thank you. Well, let me come. You put your reputation on the line. Your name, your name is up for grabs. You done, boy. <laughs> but ain't 
see, we had a good time while we was here. <laughs> hey, <laughs> the little boy come to our church. Steve, what was the little old boy's name that went, who? Brit. Brit. Little old Brit was eight. Brit got saved in the children's church one morning. And his mother and daddy hadn't been there long. They standing down there, and little old Brit standing right there. One night after service looking up at me. And kids running everywhere, you know, going just everywhere. And little old Brit was standing there, and I, got, I grabbed one. I said, boy, what you doing running around up here? Hey. And the little old Brit was standing there. I said, can I help you? He said, yes, sir. His daddy was standing down there. He said, he wants to tell you something. I said, what is it? He said, this morning, I got saved. I said, Brent. That I asked him his name. He told me, I said, that's wonderful. I said, greatest thing that ever happened to you, son. Greatest thing that ever happened to you. Happened to you this morning. You got saved. That's wonderful. His mother came and got him and took him off, and she was taking him back. I see it when I'm telling you. She's taking him down the aisle. She had him by the hand. He was looking back at me. And I said, Brett, good to be saved. They came, went and got the other baby out the nursery. Came back down the aisle. Brett's coming down through there. And she got him by the arm. He looks back. I said, I'll see you, Brett. He just stopped and looked a minute. Turned around and said something to his mama and went off and they went home. Diane and I went to the house. Telephone rang and I picked it up. And it was this little boy's mama. She said, uh, Preacher, I hate to call you and bother you, but this kid won't leave me alone. He wanted me to call you and just tell you that he was glad you remembered his name. That's all he's been talking about ever since the preacher said my name. Do you hear him? He knew my name. He knows who I am. I said, put him on the phone. They put the little Brit on the phone. I said, Brit, ain't it good to be saved? He throwed the phone down. Mama, he said it again. She came to the phone. She said, you don't know what you know in his name meant to him. I said, God bless y'all and good night. Hung up. We're sitting down eating. Larry, Larry, Diane was in the bedroom, but nobody else there. And all of a sudden, it hit me. God knows my name. Hallelujah. You know why? 